Hey, welcome back to the book of Exodus. Today we're moving on into Exodus chapter 6, and just one verse today, Exodus 6 verse 1. I'm going to read it for you. Then the Lord said to Moses, Now you will see what I will do to Pharaoh. For under compulsion he will let them go, and under compulsion he will drive them out of his land. So yesterday we listened as Moses poured out complaints and critiques over God's plan to deliver his people and how, you know, hey, things aren't moving fast enough yet. I pressed the button on the microwave and why aren't we delivered yet? <laughs> so today we're going to look at the first part of God's response. So let's see what God says back to Moses. And basically God's response here is, okay, now, now and things are set up, now I'm ready to act. And I'm going to force Pharaoh to let them go. So basically here, God is reiterating his promise. He's come down to deliver. He's just telling Moses in so many words, hold on, you know, you, your expectations aren't quite right. I'm doing this with the right timing. You would have me do it in the wrong timing. So, you know, it's coming. It's, it's imminent. Hold on tight. God's telling Moses something like that. And kind of this is a way of God saying more, more or less indirectly, Moses, you don't understand my timing. Don't worry about it. So many times we don't understand God's process. We don't understand what God's doing. He's, he's doing more than one thing. You and I, we're kind of kind of small, you know, we live in this little little thinking box, and you know, we're gonna do something, we've got one thing on our mind. Oh, I need to, I need to stop at the store and buy this. Uh, we got one thing on our mind. But in fact, God is working lots of angles. So let's think a little bit more about God's timing. Faith isn't developed to maturity in a moment. Hey, and God could transport these people to Israel in a moment in time. Boom, here we are. Hey, what's going on? Here we are. He doesn't do it that way. So in this situation, God has two primary, two primary pieces I think he's working with. Number one, how do I grow the faith of these Hebrews, these downtrodden people? And number two, how can I best increase receptivity of the Egyptians to me, the true God? Those are the two things on God's mind, so to speak, here. He's got, he's working both of those angles. The faith of a lot of the Hebrews has grown pretty dim. Now, now some of them still believe, praise the Lord, but a lot of the Hebrews need to stretch out and increase their faith by practice, by action, by, by trusting in him. So the Egyptian view holds to all these gods and goddesses. It's pantheistic, you know, there's the Niles of God. So really, one thing that would do go a long ways is sorting out what, all these things that are claimed to be gods, how many of them really are gods? And what about the God of the Hebrews? Is he God? Is he not God? What is God? Who is God? Sorting that question out would just would just clarify all kinds of stuff. So these are some of the things that God is thinking on as he's sorting out what he's going to deliver, do to deliver these people. So what we are about to see is going to be a contest between the God who is and the gods that are not. It's going to be God versus the Egyptian gods. And so this is, a, this is a very important clarification point because it has to do with where you place your trust. I guess you could say this is going to be a contest over really whether there really is anyone out there who's listening, which is also the question of whether or not people are worth communicating with or not. You know, if there is a God, then would he care to communicate with us, or are we so far below him? So is he so indifferent to us that he doesn't care? That's a question that's going to be answered here. Because if there is a personal God who made us somewhat like himself, presumably he's going to want to listen to us and communicate with us and deliver us from all these non-existent gods. So let's see what happens. Thank you.